I want to start out with some more teaching today and then get into some more practical stuff. Teaching is in, I want to cover, while your brain is fresh, I want to give you some things that are a little bit harder to understand. And then whenever your brain's a bunch of mush, um, then I'll preach, spiritually apply some things. And uh, let's see, Romans chapter 1. Praise the Lord, the Lord did that for me, amen. There's a part in the beginning of the lesson I told Grace last night, I didn't know if I wanted to include it. I said, it's kind of confusing. I don't know if I want to teach it. I was like, but I'll just bring it and I might teach it anyways. And then I realized I didn't print it off. It didn't print off, so the Lord answered my question. He said, no, you're not going to cover it today. So anyways, praise the Lord. Um, He must not want me to cover it. All right, Romans chapter 1, we'll begin reading. I want to just reread these verses, 1 through 17, and we'll pick up around verse number um, 15 with the teaching. Uh, Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God, which he had promised to fore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Remember, that's important. It shows that Jesus Christ was of a David seed, which comes through the line of his mother, which means he was a... Uh, he was uh, not uh, born of man's seed, which is sinful. Uh, and remember over there in Genesis 3.15, he said, Thy seed, the woman's seed, shall bruise the serpent's head. With power, verse 4, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to faith among all nations for his name, verse 5. Among whom also ye are called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. We'll pick up with that later there about praying. Uh, Making requests, verse 10. This is his prayer request. If by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Um, Paul did have a prosperous journey, amen, but he um, also had a perilous journey. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I might be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even among, as, as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the Baptists, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me, I uh, am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness, righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. God, thank you for being good to us. And just pray, Lord, that these next few minutes, uh, Lord, you'd help us, God, to get something from your book, from your word. I ask and pray in Jesus Christ's name, and amen. Amen. Uh, the first thing I wanted to cover today, if you remember, Romans is a book of the gospel. He mentions the gospel uh, several times throughout the book of Romans. And I wanted to go through today, starting out, uh, the different Gospels there are in your Bible. Um, now, if you remember, uh, I know you know, you know the verse, uh, Romans chapter 10, Blessed are the feet, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Um, the glad tidings of good things. The gospel is glad tidings. It's good things. It's good news. Um, it's whenever you're presenting a specific message uh, to people. Now, Galatians 1, 7 through 9, I'm not even write, going to write it down. Galatians 1, 7 through 9 says that if a man preaches another gospel, let him be accursed, um, meaning let him be damned. Meaning, Paul's warning, if anyone preaches a different gospel than what I'm preaching, let him be cursed. That means there are other gospels. And that's why it's important to understand what uh, the gospels are, what different gospels are. And uh, also not rightly dividing. So we're going to do some rightly dividing today just briefly. I mean, we're just really going to scratch the surface. But um, if you don't rightly divide, that's whenever it brings forth confusion and it brings us forth damnation. The Holocaust came because Hitler wanted to bring in the Third Reich, the Third Reign, Reich uh, Reign. Am I saying that right? I'm not German. Reich? Reich? Um, it means kingdom or empire. Uh, the Catholic Crusades came from them thinking that they should, were supposed to set up their kingdom here on earth, Christ's kingdom. Uh, they Charismatics, they take something, a promise that's made to somebody else. They take a gospel message that's taken for somebody else in another time and they apply it to today. Jehovah's Witnesses do the same thing. Mormons do the same thing. Black uh, Israelites, they all do the same thing. They take promises, gospel messages that are for other people and they don't belong to them and they try claiming it for themselves. So, turn over to Matthew 4, Matthew chapter 4. Uh, Can someone 
Someone name out a gospel. Oh, you did the same thing your daughter did the other day. Those are the, uh, the gospels of the apostles, I guess, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Name the gospel messages. The everlasting gospel, that's one we'll cover. Paul's gospel. Paul's gospel. Um, Paul calls it my gospel, but yes, it, it is Paul's gospel. That's what it is in, in the Bible. The other words are, um, the other things used are uh, the gospel of God and the gospel of um, Jesus Christ. Those are the terms you'll find in the Bible, but yeah, Paul's gospel. Um, the gospel of Christ, uh, what are the other two? Jesus had a gospel. Mm-hmm. He had two of them. Yep. So you have the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Those are the four gospels uh, that you'll find. Now, Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 23, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Oh, he was teaching. Uh, I love whenever you hear men say, bless God, he was a preacher. Bless God, that's all I know is to preach. Well, he was also a teacher. Amen. Paul actually told Timothy to teach more than he said preach. If you run the references on teaching and preaching, uh, Paul told Timothy to teach more than he did preach. Um, preaching the gospel, look at there in verse uh, 23, the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now again, if you get the gospels wrong, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the gospel of Paul and the everlasting gospel, you're going to read that and say, oh, we care about the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. We're all about the kingdom. Uh, you hear charismatics talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. And the Catholic Church about the kingdom, the kingdom. Whenever I came here and I talked to the man on uh, the Wednesday before we, I got, the Wednesday I got the keys to this place. Um, I told the man who was showing me around and gave me the keys. I said, I'm so thankful you guys are giving this to us for free. You're letting us do it without paying any rent. He goes, man, he goes, we just care about the kingdom. We just want to further the kingdom. And I go, yeah, us too. <laughs> We're all about the kingdom. Yeah. All about the kingdom. And uh, I believe in the kingdom. I believe the kingdom of God is here right now. Um, but that's not really the message you're supposed to preach the most, although it, it does encompass what we're doing. So let's start off with the kingdom of heaven. Um, the kingdom of heaven, I'm going to try my best to draw a crown, is a literal physical kingdom. It's a kingdom that comes, uh, it'll come during the millennial reign. It, it's a kingdom that is through the seed of David. Remember the sure mercies of David, the covenant that God made with David. He said, someone of your seed is going to sit down on the kingdom um, turn over to, or uh, they're going to sit down on the throne of David. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. It's a physical, literal, earthly kingdom uh, where a literal person is going to be ruling and reigning from a literal throne. It's not spiritual, and it's not the uh, gospel that Paul preached either. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, Jesus Christ is getting ready to come and be um, baptized there in that chapter. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, so that's, again, Jesus Christ of the seed of David. It's a literal physical kingdom with someone sitting on a literal throne. Um, it pre it's presented in Matthew chapter 3. And the reason why is John the Baptist is saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, meaning Jesus Christ is getting ready to come down and walk down the river Jordan. And John the Baptist is saying, if you want your kingdom... With the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ that was prophesied to come, uh, here he is. And Jesus Christ didn't walk down there with a bunch of angels. He didn't walk down there in a, in a gold chariot. He didn't walk down there with a, a golden scepter or anything like that. He walked down in plain Jewish clothes, and that was it. And they all look up there, and they say, this is our Messiah. And John the Baptist says, yep, this is him. This is the one that we prophesied of. And what happened is they rejected him. They rejected Jesus Christ. The Jews overall reject Jesus, so he goes to the Gentiles. Um, but what John the Baptist is offering is he's saying, your, your kingdom, if you want it, Jews, here he is. This is the ruler. And they look at Jesus and say, yeah, no, we're good. We'll take somebody else. They don't want Jesus as their Messiah. There were some that believed on Jesus, but the, the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they did not want him. So the Jews overall, their leaders rejected him. Uh, so the Jews overall rejected Jesus. So he goes then to the Gentiles. Um, so that is the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew and, Mark, if, or Matthew and Luke, if you notice those gospels, they start giving the lineage of Jesus because they're wanting to show you this. If the kingdom of heaven comes right now, it's going to be through this man, Jesus Christ. And if the Jews would have accepted Jesus, the church age would have never have happened. You would have had the millennial reign uh, set up immediately right there. Uh, that's why people call the church age a 
uh, parenthetical dispensation, meaning it's a period of time that could have not happened um, if Jesus would have been if Jesus would have been accepted. And people will debate on that and say, no, it's not a parenthetical. God knew it was going to happen. He didn't know it was going to happen. He knows everything. But um, number two, the kingdom of God. The best way I can illustrate this is with a crown that's see-through. You say, why? Uh, Because the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Turn over to, I hate using the word literal. I'm going to use the word physical. Because the spiritual world is literal, amen? Uh, uh, Physical. They reject Jesus, um, but they're also being offered the kingdom of God. Look over in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 and verse number 14. Mark 1, 14. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So again, this gospel is the kingdom of God. Uh, they have different names, and I've heard men say this. It's pretty deep. Um, you know that they're different gospels because they're, they're, diff- they're spelled different. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, they're spelled different. Um, they're different gospels. The reason why he is preaching the uh, kingdom of God is at hand is that it is at hand. Jesus Christ is showing up, and if you'll notice, um, Jesus Christ, whenever he comes to the gospels, he does a lot of spiritual healing. He preaches a lot to the inward man. As a matter of fact, he tells those Pharisees on the inside is what you need to get clean. That's a spiritual kingdom. Turn over to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, the voice of the one crying. Amen. In the wilderness. Romans chapter 14, and it gives a definition here of the kingdom of God. Paul explains it. Romans 14 verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, not physical things, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The uh, kingdom of God is a uh, spiritual kingdom that you can't see with your visible eyes. And it's present right now. The reason why it's being offered is he's saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus Christ is both of them. Um, If you want peace inside of your heart, you need to accept Jesus Christ. You need to believe on him. Um, If you want the kingdom of heaven, Jews, you can have it, but that's a physical kingdom. So there are two different kingdoms there. Whenever Jesus Christ is present, both these kingdoms are present. Whenever Jesus Christ dies, this kingdom goes back up to heaven, back up to the clouds. Uh, It it exists no more. Uh, Jesus Christ is up in the third heaven right now. The physical kingdom is not here on earth. It's not being presented. It'll be presented again or it'll come during the millennium. Um, But right now you still have the kingdom of God being present. Um, It's a spiritual kingdom. We can be born into the kingdom of God. Over in Galatians 5, it says, Whosoever doeth these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And those things are all spiritual sins, uh, lasciviousness and um, gossiping and backbiting, those uh, sins of the flesh over in Galatians 5. Um, so there are those two uh, gospels. Then you have the gospel of Christ. Uh, you don't have to turn there because um, you all know 1 Corinthians 15, uh, this is the gospel by which ye are saved. Um, how Jesus Christ, he came into the world, uh, he lived. How, how does that drawing go like this? Um, went to a tomb, a big rock in front of it, something like that. I've seen people draw it out like that uh, for people. Uh, Jesus Christ died. He came into the world. He died. Uh, he was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So you believe that you're a sinner. You believe Jesus Christ died for your sins. That's the gospel of Paul. Paul called it my gospel. He said, if anyone preaches to you a different gospel, let him be accursed. Now, the thing you've got to get down is people say, well, I think they're all the same. How in the world would John the Baptist be saying, uh, preaching the gospel of Paul? Jesus hadn't died yet. Um, he, didn't, he didn't preach that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. He's not preaching this gospel yet. Um, uh, in the Old Testament, they didn't preach this gospel because uh, it didn't happen yet. The gospel of uh, Paul, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so that's the gospel we're saved by. Look over in Revelation 14. Revelation 14. I know some of you know this, and uh, you can go deeper into these uh, subjects, but I don't really think you need to go a lot deeper. I mean, you can, I guess, if you want to do a Bible Institute or something, but um, I don't think you need to. The best picture I can do for the everlasting gospel, this is an infinity sign, right? Um, 
everlasting gospel. Uh, Turn over to Revelation chapter 14. And you say, Aaron, I think that these are all the same gospels. Well, you look and tell me who's preaching this gospel, and then you let me know if our gospel is the same. Revelation 14, 1. I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion uh, with him uh, 140 and 4,000. Having his father's name written in their foreheads, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder. I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Um, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne, before the beasts and the elders. No man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Um, does this sound like anything that's going on right now? No. They, uh, these, uh, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whither ever so he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Look in verse 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them. So an angel is flying around, and he has the gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue, saying with a loud voice, I believe this is what explains what the everlasting gospel is, um, but I think there's going to be more to it. Saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the mountain and the fountains of water. Um, Look down here, we'll just read a couple more verses. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out uh, without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Um, and look, look down there in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So notice something. I believe the everlasting gospel during the tribulation, I believe, number one, that we don't know everything that it entails. The same way that John the Baptist didn't understand Paul's gospel because it hadn't happened yet, I don't believe that we're going to know everything for the everlasting gospel. Um, I've heard men say, well, we need to be preparing people for the tribulation. No, we don't. We're not going to be here. Our job is not to prepare people for the tribulation. Our job is to warn them of it, but we're going to be gone. God's going to have new people preaching in the tribulation. He's going to have Moses and Elijah come back up. Uh, He's going to have angels flying around preaching the everlasting gospel. This is not the gospel that we preach. Um, So I don't think we know everything that this gospel entails. It does look like um, you have to, it says, uh, the patience of the saints that keep the commandments of God. There's going to be some commandments they're going to keep. I don't know if it goes back to the whole Old Testament law or just part of it. Um, I know that they have to help the Jews during the tribulation. I know that's part of the commandments of God. Um, I know they also can't take the mark. They said they will not worship his image. Uh, So they can't worship the image uh, of the beast. Uh, They can't receive his mark in their forehead there in verse 9. They have to fear God. They have to glorify God. Um, So that is the everlasting gospel. And that's what's going to be preached during the tribulation. Um, Does anyone have questions about those four gospels? Do they make sense? Um, Yes, there will be another gospel that is preached. um, And people say, well, I think it's this, I think it's that. Paul said, don't preach another gospel. I don't think he means that we're not allowed to know about it, but I would be leery about a man that says, you know, God's given me insight into the new gospel, the everlasting gospel, the tribulation. I don't know. It says an angel's going to be flying around preaching it, and God's going to have other men. He's going to have 144,000 witnesses. I mean... I, just, I don't think we're supposed to have a whole lot of light on it, but I mean, if you want to study it out more, I would be interested. Um, and we'll study the tribulation at a way later time um, and kind of what they're going to have to do during the tribulation to be saved. Um, turn back over to Romans 1. Romans 1. So, Aaron, do you, are, are you for the gospel of the kingdom? Yes, I am, the kingdom of God. Um, I'm not trying to bring in an earthly, physical kingdom there right now. That's why you have the Crusades where they went and killed a bunch of people to try to set up their kingdom. Uh, uh, Notice something in uh, Romans 1, verse verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Um, Turn over to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter uh, 2. It's one of the minor prophets, uh, Nahum, Habakkuk. You'll see Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 4. Habakkuk 2, 4.
Habakkuk 2 4. Am I going too fast for everybody? Is everybody good? We're good. Good? Oh. I don't know if you know this or not, but I did practice it last year. I practiced auctioneering some. One dollar one, one dollar two. One, I practiced a little bit just to, I thought it would be a good skill to have. You never know. Um, but I think it's affected my speaking speed a little bit. Habakkuk 2 4, look at this verse. Behold, his soul which was lifted up um, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. His faith. You notice how in Romans 1 17 it just says the just shall live by faith. Um, This is a good example of in the uh, Old Testament, salvation was different, and I'm not going to get into a long discussion of it. This was actually what my notes were on that um, I was going to teach through. I think it gets confusing. I think you can put it simply like this um, without covering all the different dispensations. In the Old Testament, I believe they did have faith, and I believe that faith led to works. I'm going to explain why this is important. In that same verse, Romans 1.17, wait. Romans 1.17, it says, faith to faith. Did you notice that? And instead of saying that just he shall live by his faith, it just says the just shall live by faith. It takes out the word his. Um, in the Old Testament, by faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham journeyed. By faith, uh, Moses forsook Egypt. By faith, and it brings an action that they did. And it says they have faith. Now, there are people that teach And what it is, is Dr. Ruckman, and there were other men, but Dr. Ruckman's the one that we know, so I'll use his name, and I'm not dissing him, but he wanted to go really hard against work salvation. So he harped on the idea that there is no way they weren't saved even the slightest bit like we are. There was no faith involved. It was all works. And he uses this, this uh, this is one of his arguments, Um, faith only shows up, the word faith shows up one time in the Old Testament. And he says, in the Old Testament, it was works, it was works, it was works. Well, the problem with that is the New Testament tells us that they live by faith. So that's not right. And also, uh, just because faith only shows up one time, but faithfulness and uh, faithful, uh, they show up uh, numerous times. I forget how much. But those words show up numerous times. Um, Faithful and faithfulness. Uh, So they did live by faith in the Old Testament. It's just whenever they had faith in God, they uh, did something with it. They did something physical. In the New Testament... Whenever, they ha- whenever you have faith in the New Testament under this dispensation, your faith leads to faith. Meaning, you have faith. Turn over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And verse number 21. I'll show you this, and then we'll move on. And the reason why I want you to get this down, there's a lot of people that will argue about this, and they're going to say uh, they're going to say everybody in the Old Testament was looking forward to the Calvary. I don't believe that. I don't think they knew. The Bible says they didn't know about it. So again, um, and I'm talking about people I know that believe everybody was looking forward to Calvary. No, they were look, they believed God. They had faith in God. They believed His commandment, and it brought about physical works. Acts twenty twenty one says. Acts twenty twenty one testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice that uh, repentance towards God and then faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, whenever you believe God, you just have faith again. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Some people will argue about what's the gift there in Ephesians 2, 8. How many of you have heard this argument? Have you ever talked to somebody? They say that the faith in Ephesians 2, 8 is the gift. It's not the grace, it's the gift. Okay, you guys don't know that. I'm not going to expound on it. Um, in the New Testament, it's faith to faith. You believe God, you have faith in Jesus Christ. Old Testament, you believe God, you did something physical. Um, and we won't even go into all the other arguments. People say that, well, it's the faith that's the gift, it's not the grace, and that is foolish too, and that's what Calvinists use to teach total depravity, saying that you can't have faith unless God gives it to you. Um, everything that you have is a gift from God, including your faith, including grace, including the Word of God, including the Holy Spirit. It's all a gift of God. A Calvinist says you can't get saved unless God gives you the faith to be saved. That's true, but you can't do anything unless God allows you to do it. He also gives you a free will. That's a gift from God that you have a free will. Um, so you have a free will to choose to accept Him or reject Him. So anyways, that was um, back with that verse there in Romans 1, something I wanted to go over. Um, and something else I want to point out about that. Did you notice this? Did you notice Paul didn't stay true to the originals? Paul, Paul didn't stay true to the originals. Um, whenever Jesus Christ quoted the Old Testament, he did not quote it verbatim to the Old Testament. People say, we've got to stay true to the originals. Well, Jesus didn't do that and Paul didn't do that. 
and none of those manuscripts that they say does, has it happened either. Um, God has always preserved His Word at certain times with certain men, and uh, He's doing it right here with the Apostle Paul. He's going to preserve this Word right here in English um, the way that He wants it to be preserved, and it's not the exact same as it was in the Old Testament. Um, so Paul didn't stay true to the originals either. Amen. We got all the preachers down the front row. Amen. Amen. Ain't that wonderful? I like it. Um, all right. Let's go back to, uh, I told you that was some more of the heavier stuff, I guess. Um, look back there in verse 9. I want to pick up there, verse 9. I want to show you some things here. Verse 9, Romans 1. Romans 1. Uh, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Um, that without ceasing, that just means always. It means constantly, he says always. It just means he's praying often. It doesn't mean he's praying 24-7. It just means he's praying often. Um, I want you to notice he gives them a spiritual gift, not a physical. In verse number 11, he says, um, he says, hey, fellas, Isaac, guys, if you're going to sit up here, we got to sit. And you guys are kind of young to understand this. You got to sit, though, if you're going to be up here. You sit over here. Can you sit over here? You're doing good. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, you're doing good. I noticed the progression. I love it. Um, all right. Always, always praying. Um, I want to go over just some things on prayer. Uh, notice he says, I have something to give you, and it's, it's a spiritual gift. He says, I want to impart unto you a gift. And then it's, he tells you what it is. It's faith. Look down there in verse number 12. To get, I want to be comforted with you together by the mutual faith, both of you and me. His gift is spiritual. Um, you and I can serve God in the Spirit, and we are to serve God in the Spirit. You'll get more done for God if you do it in the Spirit than in the flesh. Um, if you want to serve God in the flesh, and you can mark somebody that's serving God in the flesh, oftentimes they'll be burnt out, bitter, stressed out, worried, uh, contentious, angry. Um, they'll be over overworked, overlabored, and what that is is they're serving God in the flesh. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to sit back and say, I'm not going to do anything physical, I'm just going to pray. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, I've been praying for you always, and he says, I want something to give to you, and it's a spiritual gift. It's a spiritual gift. And God, whenever you and I pray uh, for something, whether we're praying for a church to be started, whether we're praying for a missionary, whether we're praying for a soul to be saved, I believe God, to some extent, I believe God rewards you and I for that in heaven. A good example of that is this. Moses and David, they both go out to war in the Old Testament at different times, and they give the people that stayed back by the stuff, the people that couldn't go out to war, they were too tired, they were too weary. Um, He gave the ones that stayed back and didn't do physical fighting, he rewarded them as if they did go out and fight. He said, it's just as important the job you're doing, staying around, just being faithful and watching the stuff, watching the camp, watching the women and the children, uh, taking care of those things is just as important as the men that went out and fought. So the physical labor was just important as the one that you wouldn't say isn't so physical demanding. And uh, if you notice another example, David had a desire to build a house for God, but he never got to. But God still accredited that to his account. His son gets to do it. And not only that, God says, David, you want to build me a house? I'm not going to let you do it while you're here alive, but I'm going to build you a house. God took David's prayer and one-upped him. He said, I'm going to build you an everla- a, 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 a throne. He said, there's going to be a throne that's going to come out of your house. He said, David, I know that you pray that you wanted this to happen. It's not going to happen in your lifetime, but once you're dead and gone, you're going to see it happen. You're going to see it come to pass. Um, and that's what, when you and I pray, we may not see it come to pass um, here on earth, but in heaven it will. Uh, I know uh, the references for that are Numbers 31 and 1 Samuel 30. Numbers 31 and 1 Samuel 30, you can read about Moses and David doing that. Um, I like what Brother Buddy Blancol said. He said whenever he prays, sometimes he'll pray for people that are already dead to get saved. And he said the reason why is God works outside of time. So we're looking at it like the person's dead, they're, they're done for. Well, Jesus could raise up people from the dead, preach to them again, Lazarus and different ones. He said sometimes he would pray hoping that maybe God would go back in time and then preach to that person again and they might get saved. And you say, Aaron... That blows my mind. It will. It'll blow your mind and it'll blow your prayer life. But you got to remember, God works outside of our time zone. We a lot of times ask God to do something now in this time, and God's saying, 
well, I want to do it, I want to do it 2,000 years ago, or I want to answer it 10 years ago, or I want to answer it 10 years ahead of time. He's working outside of our time, our time frame. I just thought that was interesting. Um, we'll go through hindrances of prayer um, at another time. We'll go through some different hindrances to prayer, and we'll run some references on that. Um, I want to show you a couple more things here that I think will help you. Uh, notice in verse number 10, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. I said it before, he did have a prosperous journey, but he also had a perilous one. Um, he came a preacher to Rome, but he also came a prisoner to Rome. Acts 21 through 28 tells you about that. Uh, God got Paul to where he wanted him. There were just a lot of bumps along the road. And you and I will have a lot of bumps uh, along the road getting to where God wants us to be, but the point is God will get you there. And notice he said by any means. He said at length, uh, if by any means now, at length I might have a prosperous journey. He's saying at all cost, whatever, God, whatever I have to go through to get to you and to preach to you, he said I'm willing to do it. He gave God a blank check and God gave him chains. He, God gave him chains. He said, God, you can do whatever you want with my life. And God said, all right, I'm going to put you in chains. Um, but that's what you and I ought to do uh, with God. Is we ought to say, God, uh, whatever it takes for us to build this church, whatever it takes for me to um, prepare and to uh, build up uh, whatever it is, my own life, my own spiritual life, God, whatever it takes at all costs by any means, I'll do it. Um, and again, Paul didn't go to the place God wanted him to go. All right, let me say this. Paul didn't want to go to the place God wanted him to go. Paul had a burden elsewhere to the Jews, but God wanted him to come to Rome. And God does that with a person. If a person says, God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do, even whenever it goes against their will, I believe God will work it to where he gets them to where he wants them to go because they're, they're willing to do it. Now, you and I might have a burden for something and say, God, I really want to do this. And God says, but you told me you would do anything by all means that I ask you to do. So sometimes you'll even battle your own will. You'll go against what you want to do and what God wants to do, but you're still willing to do whatever God wants you to do. I know it's confusing, but that's kind of how the Christian life is. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, brother, his name is, I think, Jack Butts is his name. He's Dilbert Terry's associate pastor. He went down to PBI for three years, and he, he knew he was going to be a missionary. He said, I'm going to be a missionary, I'm going to be a missionary. And he was praying on just a place to go, and he took several missions trips. And uh, one day the Holy Ghost spoke to him. He was praying on it. He was sitting there in the church, and his after services, kids were running around playing. Uh, the, the choir's up there practicing. And uh, the Lord said to him, he said, uh, Jack, he said, what do you want to do? And Jack said, I want to teach the Word of God. I want to see souls saved. I want to build up families. I want to help other people um, in the church. I want to help a pastor get, get raised up. And he said, Jack, look around. Jack was helping his pastor. He was helping build a church. He was helping preach and teach the Word of God. He was seeing souls saved and baptized. And uh, Jack said, I realized that everything I wanted was right there. He was willing to go somewhere else, and he wanted to go somewhere else, but God showed him along the way. He said, remember whenever you told me that you'd do anything I wanted you to do? I want you to stay here. And there are times in your and I's life whenever we say, God, I'm ready to go. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to go somewhere else. And God says, no, I want you to stay here. And uh, he'll direct you and guide you. So Paul said, by any means, I'm going to come unto you. And uh, he did come by any means. He came in chains. Look down in verse 11. I love this about Paul. I want you to notice Paul's attitude, his mentality. Verse number 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. To the end that you may be established. Notice Paul's attitude. Paul's not like a lot of, I'll call them Bible believers. Uh, a lot of times they wear it as a badge of honor, but I'm a Bible believer too. I just don't act like a bunch of my close, my close godly relatives. Um, you notice that Paul liked people? You notice that Paul liked people. He liked teaching the Word of God. He liked uh, fellowshipping with the saints of God. Paul was excited about it. Notice he said, I long to see you. If you notice the whole attitude of Romans there in the beginning, Paul has an attitude of excitement. Uh, he has an attitude of excitement. He's excited about what's happening. He's excited about what's getting ready to happen. Um, he's excited about it. And he says, and I long to see you, meaning he missed God's people. He missed being around God's people. Um, and you and I ought to miss when we're not around God's people. Um, look down there and uh, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Uh, notice he had something to give away. 
He had something to give away. Hey, Isaac, could he stay back there? Sorry. You're fine. Just could he stay back there in the back? Sorry about that. Um, we'll eventually have something, hopefully soon, uh, in the other room. Um, I was just trying to get down the flow of things. Amen. But sorry about that. Um, notice he, had, he said, I want to impart to you some spiritual gift. Paul had something he wanted to give away to others. He had something he wanted to give away to others. You and I, as Christians, ought to have something to give away. Um, I've seen this a lot uh, of times uh, with different people. Um, and I'll even say preachers. Uh, you ever done this? You ever went to a meeting or a preacher's fellowship or something like that, and a preacher gets up and he says, I didn't have anything prepared. I didn't know I was going to preach. And you're thinking, well, it's a preacher's fellowship. That's usually what they do. Um, it always bothers me whenever a preacher doesn't have something to give away. Because that's what he's called to do. He's called to give away something to other people. He's called to have a message to give other people, a sermon to give other people. That's his calling, supposedly, is to have something to give away. And Paul's attitude was, I want to give you something. I want to bring you something. And you and I ought to have the same attitude. So he longs to see them. He misses God's people. And then he says, I want to give you something spiritual. He has something to give them. And then he says, to the end that you may be established. To the end that you may be established. Paul was concerned about how they were going to do with the judgment seat of Christ. He was concerned about them being established in the Word of God, being established in their faith, and uh, doing uh, something at the judgment seat of Christ, being able uh, to have rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. He said, to the end that you may be established. Um, he was concerned about it. And that was his attitude. That was his zeal. And he shows that throughout the whole introduction of this, uh, this book. Um, I'll close with this one. Uh, we'll close a little early today. Uh, I want you to notice in verse number 14... Verse 14, he said, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Um, just so you know, the barbarians were anybody that were not Greek. Uh, the Greeks actually used to make fun of um, other cultures. They would imitate their language and they would just go bar, 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 because uh, they're making fun of them. Uh, the Greeks were very lofty, very high-minded. Um, they thought they were better than everybody else. They thought their language was better. Their culture was better. They thought they were more educated than everybody else. They thought they had, they thought, believe it or not, they thought they were at the pinnacle of humanity. They thought that they had evolved to the point and they were the wisest people that ever existed, um, which sounds an awful lot like people today, but just so you know, that's nothing new. Pete the Greek, Pete the Greek yeah. He has some of those characteristics. But uh, people say this, a lot of people think that they were stupid back in biblical times and they didn't have a lot of, intelligence or that they didn't have a lot of uh, medical intelligence, different things like that. You know they found skulls of people from 4000 BC that have uh, little incisions in their heads where they believe they're doing brain surgery. They believe they're releasing pressure and different things in the skull. Um, there's all the pyramids, Mayan pyramids, Egyptian pyramids, there's all kinds of things uh, and we're going to go through that at some point down the road but um, people weren't ignorant back then. But the Greeks were in a culture where they believed that they were at the pinnacle and everyone else that wasn't like them were all barbarians. Um, but I want you to notice something. Paul was able to witness both to the barbarians and to the Greeks, to the wise and to the unwise. Paul was able to minister to somebody that was educated and wealthy, like he does over in the book of Acts. He ministers to a bunch of women that are wealthy women and educated women, Lydia and the women that were praying with her. Um, he also witnesses to those in Athens, um, and then he also witnesses to the Philippian jailer. He doesn't have an educational background. He witnesses to those in prison. Uh, the point is that he's able to minister to all different kinds of people. From the very elite of society down to the very lowest of society, he's able to witness to them. My point is this, Paul was pliable, he was usable. And a lot of people will say, well, I'm just, I can only witness to the down and outers or I can only witness to the elite. No, God wants you to witness to everybody. The reason why a lot of people don't want to witness to the elite or the college educated or people with money is because they're intimidated by them. And instead of studying a little bit, being able to answer them and uh, prepare responses to them and study, whether it's study history, culture, science, whatever it is, or even dress a little bit nicer, maybe save up some money, get some nicer clothes so you don't feel ashamed or you're around them, uh, people will just say, well, my people are just the down and outers. Uh, my people personally are down and outers and college kids. I have a burden from, for all of them. I have a burden for the drug addict on the street. I have a burden for the person in Reynoldsburg that's in a $400,000 home. I have a burden for all of them. And so did Paul. Paul said, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. And uh, something I, I challenge you to do is to say, uh, ask yourself, do you have a burden? 
for people across the whole spectrum? And are you able to minister to people across the whole spectrum? Um, or can you only minister to people that are like you, that are at your socioeconomic status, that are at your um, educational background? Uh, Paul said, I can minister to the lowest and to the highest. And that was his um, burden. Um, that is all I have. Uh, I had some other stuff. We'll cover it next week. Anybody have any questions about anything? You're fine. Yes. In the everlasting gospel. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and the tribulation will be faith and works, yeah. and again, the Old Testament was faith as well. But um, but they, had, they, they, they had ordinances, commandments, yeah, and it says that about their faith and the commandments. I think it's verse number twelve, yeah. So, and it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see too what all they have to keep. I know of a few of them, but uh, what all laws they have to keep. So. Yeah, yeah. We'll eventually cover. Yeah. Amen. Well, let's say a word of prayer and then we can um, eat a little bit of food and fellowship and then we'll be done. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. God, thank you for being so good to us. And I thank you, Lord, just for this morning. And I thank you, Lord, for the lesson. And uh, God, I pray, Lord, you'd um, help us, Lord, just today, Lord, to serve you, God, to um, take in the things that we learn and then God apply them. Um, Paul knew about the different kingdoms. He knew about the different gospels, Lord. This is why he preached on them and about them. And uh, but, Lord, he also uh, wanted to witness and tell people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, help that to be our focus and help us, God, to be a soul conscious, Lord, this weekend. And pray, Lord, you bless everything that is to follow, Lord. Bless the food and the nourishment of our bodies. And uh, thank you, Lord, just for the ladies that took time to prepare it. And pray, Lord, that uh, you just bless us now. Lord, we love you. We thank you and praise you. And ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. And amen. 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 Were you able to hear over there? Yeah. Were you? yeah.